Sometimes your research is through crime cases and it's like, I can't even read between the lines. It's not just even that we're not on the same page. We're not even reading the same book of life, bro. We're in the presence of greatness. Behave accordingly. Hi. You look lost, but I, I think we just found you. I think we did. I think we did. You're gonna love this one. Well, you know, as much as you can love a true crime case. Because this is a case of a suitcase killer on a series that's called Gone Bad, where ordinary people convert to crime. Let's get straight into this one, because it's a doozy. A person was hired to do some lawn mowing on the rural highways in Wisconsin in 2014, when they were just sitting in their tractor, they were just doing the lawn mowing, once they discovered these two suitcases next to the road. And it was obvious to this person that there was a presence of dead body in those suitcases because they were already infested with flies, with different insects, with maggots. So they immediately alerted the police. Once the police is there, they open those two suitcases and realize that they contain two separate bodies. Their immediate observations led them to believe that these bodies are in two different stages of decomposition. And one of the victim's hands was mummified, meaning they were there in those suitcases for a long time. So the police immediately puts the tape around the area and they start searching within like one, two mile radius just for the possibility of other victims' disposal sites because they believed that they had a serial killer on their hands. What they immediately noticed when looking at these two bodies is that this looks like a case of BDSM gone wrong. Both of the victims were tied with the same rope and they had gags in their mouth. Once they sent the bodies to autopsy, from the dental records they managed to get two names. The first name was the one of Jenny Gomez. She was the junior college student who just seemed to have abruptly left her life and she was kind of having this strange relationship with her dad. So she wasn't in contact with him much. And it just seemed like she just up and left one day and left her life behind. They were also able to identify the second victim, who was Laura Simonson. And she was a 37-year-old mom. Once they went and spoke to her family, her mom said that she also like up and left, but she immediately reported her missing. It was obvious to the whole family that Laura was going through some mental health struggles and she even left a note to her mom that she's just going to sort of like take a break. She isn't in the position to take care of her kids at the moment. So, you know, if she could just like take over and look after the children. But there are really two pieces of evidence that are going to crack this case wide open. The first one was, as I mentioned, both bodies in these suitcases were found with a rope surrounding them. So the police immediately realized it's the same rope and withdrew DNA from it. And that DNA led them to the name. The name was Steven Zelich. And the police immediately, obviously, starts looking into Steven. Where does he live? Starts tailing him. But is looking for other evidence to support the claims and to see was this really the person that has strangled these women. The second piece of evidence that is to seal this case is Steven's face on CCTV cameras. This was CCTV from a hotel where he had went with the latter victim, Laura, and he stayed overnight. However, at this hotel, she was the one to check in under her name, but then they don't have her name checking out. They just see that next day, Steven has checked out for both of them and has given them excuse that, you know, she might have left early. And once interviewed, the hotel staff member also reported that Steven was the only person that day to pay in cash. But the eeriest part, once we learn what this case is all about, is that you can see Steven on the same CCTV footage just after paying, taking one of those trolleys with his and Laura's suitcase piled up on it and just rolling it out of the hotel and putting suitcases in his car. Now that the police is surveilling Steven's house, they are also obviously collecting other evidence and they get a real break in the case when they realize that Laura, yes, did seemingly just up and left. However, she didn't delete all of her online presence. 
Rather, she gave all of her passwords, she confided all of her passwords to a friend of hers. So this friend volunteered information to the police and has given them all of Laura's passwords and the websites that these login details belong to. With this information, the detectives found the gold mine. Because they logged into this website, which was one of the BDSM websites that Laura had the account on, and this is where they found her chats with Mr. Handcuffs. So Mr. Handcuffs' profile was immediately of the interest to them because there they saw apparently a guy who was posing as Stephen, although he looked about 20 years younger, I would say, based on before and now. And also they saw a very creepy, in my opinion, description on his profile. His profile said that he was seeking a 24-7 slave for absolute ownership. There is nothing better than a slave tied tight, gagged, blindfolded and hooded. So I suppose they're having this conversation like on different calls, they're like radioing the surveillance team in front of his house, being like, no, go in, just go in, we don't have a search warrant yet, but just like do, you know, a voluntary check, see if he's going to speak to you. And they're like, okay, cool, no worries yet, maybe Mr. Handcuffs my ass, we're gonna get this guy. So the surveillance team goes in and they just want to chat with him. And Stephen immediately gives the impression that he is completely fine with this, he just came from work, he is in his security officer uniform because he works for the security place, so he doesn't give them like any impression that he is hesitant in any way and they tell him, listen, this is in connection with the two victims that we have found, there is your DNA on the scene, so we have to look into that, can we take a swab? Like, can we take your DNA? And he says, no problem at all, like, do what you need to do. And then the police officers obviously want to seize his laptop as well to confirm that these two are actually connected, that he is Mr. Handcuffs, it's not somebody else using his profile. He again says no issues whatsoever. But this is where they hit a bit of a hurdle, because once they actually looked through this laptop, it seemed like Steven installed a software that was on repeat deleting all of the information, deleting all of the conversations that he had on these websites. But at this point, what he didn't know is that they already had all of the information on Laura's laptop and that they just went and found the CCTV footage. So, of course, they now had enough for a search warrant. And while the lab is comparing his own swab, his own DNA, to the one found on the ropes, they're searching the flat. And the police is looking around and there's footage of this online. I'm not going to put you through this. There was a moment where I thought I did not subscribe to this because they found a lot of BDSM equipment, different toys, and then they point us to different ropes and bleach. And then they say, well, there's no reason for him to have this amount of bleach in the flat because look at his toilet. And then they just pointed to the toilet bowl and I was like, I did not subscribe to this crime watch, but sure, yeah, let me look at how dirty his toilet is as a proof. Hey, at least good police work. But the kicker is that among these torture tools, they find a badge, 138, issued by West Ellis Police. And they're like, oh, sir, you, um, are you a cop? And he says he was. He now works as a security officer, which later they're going to find a whole history behind that story. During all of this, he also tells them, I mean, yes, like, obviously, you know, I left the police force, but I still feel like the part of the law enforcement, you know, like, I have this security uniform and everything, but, like, I still feel like I belong, like, I could go back, you know, to the police work, and they're like, yeah, of course, well, of course you can. So the police ends up collecting all of the evidence from the scene, and soon enough, the lab comes back confirming that the DNA is his exact match. So they go and arrest him. And Stephen's police interrogation is one of the weirdest things that I have seen. First of all, the cop that is interviewing him just does not have any time for him. He just looks like, man, I'm interviewing like the person that was one of us and has then had a power trip and has committed all of this. 
But the messed up part is that Stephen is still in his security uniform in this police interrogation, and he has like the baton on him, and they're kind of having this conversation like, you know the procedure, like, you know that we should have stripped you, like, can you just take it off? And he's just like, no problem, like, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to attack, like, two police officers here. He kind of just brushes it off, which just sets this very uncomfortable tone for this whole interrogation. His statements during this interrogation were, of course, that this was an accident. Both of those women came voluntarily to that hotel where it was arranged. He'd also just explained that he was playing the choking game in which he would constrain the oxygen to the brain for the euphoric pleasure to each of the victims. And then, then it just happened by accident. He just strangled both of these victims by accident. So, in this case, there was... Uh, uh, rope around her neck. It would be tightened and then released. And tightened and released, you know, to where uh, well, the obvious control. And that's, you know, uh, although in this case, uh, well, we're also causing excitement and all of that and did not basically uh, had the rope around her neck and pulled it either hard enough and long enough okay. without releasing it okay. and resulting in, 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 in her death. Which I have a couple of problems with, and you should too, so let me break it down. You don't accidentally choke somebody. That's one misconception that Everybody just, when you first hear it as a police officer, or as a detective, as anybody in the police force, you're like, oh yeah, this is their defense, accidentally chose somebody, great. Because it just doesn't happen at best, or rather at worst, it happens within three to five minutes. So for at least three to five minutes, he had to be pulling on that rope. Second, this is not an overly dramatic like, Bollywood drama where they roll off their scarf and like fall into a suitcase. She didn't accidentally get into that suitcase. If this was accidental, you would have called 911 then and there. You wouldn't have elaborated this plot in your head. So after this weird interrogation, the case will obviously go to trial. But before we go to that, let's talk a bit about Steven. How did we get here? How did a cop turn bad? How are we here? What is his background? What was his upbringing? Was he a good cop? Why was he fired from the police force? A little is known about Steven's childhood, but he was born in October 1961. He grew up in Southside Milwaukee, and we know that his dad was a sergeant. But Steven initially went a different path. He started studying business at university, but transferred studies to criminal justice. And nobody really knows whether this was inspired or pressured by his father, but he continued studying that, graduated, and then started applying for police force. So at the age of 23, he applied to be a police officer, and on his application, he said he is motivated by a sincere desire to help people. And you and me are hearing this and thinking, yeah, sure, 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 sir, yeah, that really backfired. But his first couple of years in the force were actually really great for him. He was in a small department and he was thriving. Like, all of his colleagues described him as ambitious, like, everybody really loved working with Steven. His supervisor respected him, his colleagues called him a true asset to the department. So this was great for his ego also and for his career. And it was so great that in 1989 he was actually promoted. He was to go to a bigger department, to West Ellis, that was taking care of 6,000 people. So it was covering the area providing services to 6,000 citizens. And the people in this department had immediately a completely different picture of Steven. It just seemed like he was not competent for 
this level. He was lacking, like his arrest rate was really low. He just seems to be slacking at his work. People reported that he's like taking breaks unannounced, like whenever he wants to, rather than like whenever they should be scheduled. There were also multiple reports that he would take a squad car and then speed in it, just like showing off on the streets just because he is in the police car and would get even in a couple of accidents as well. And sometimes would try to cover up that accident. So on this one occasion, he tried to cover up that he crashed the police car. And then once his sergeant found out, because it's a squad car, mate, he had like one day suspension and then he just returned to work. But he wasn't just damaging the police property. That is actually going to be the least problematic thing he would do. There was this one incident where Stephen had a domestic violence call. So he has done a checkup and he's just left both parties just return to their own lives. Like, he didn't arrest the person, he didn't, like, make any proper notes on it, like, arrange a follow-up in this situation. None of that. And then, the next day, the police received a call, and this time it was from the same household, but it wasn't a domestic violence call. Rather, the husband called because his wife tried to commit suicide. And this behavior will just keep escalating because he's not reprimanded for it, he's not charged for it, and this is going to become a pattern in Stephen's life where he's not held responsible, he will just continue and escalate. So remember how I said like he started taking breaks unannounced whenever he wants to? Well, those breaks more and more often started to be in the local strip clubs. And this police force actually said this is the first time they have ever, in that area, had any reports by dancers in strip clubs, and now they're getting them regularly about Steven, because he is going in and harassing them. And not just that, he doesn't stop just in strip clubs. During his work shifts, he would stop these dancers, stop their cars for a traffic stop, and then would do what? Take their driver's license, learn where they lived, and would start stalking them. These women started reporting these harassments. One dancer actually reported he asked her out 1,000 times over the span of eight years. And when he couldn't get his way because, again, of his authority, not his looks or charm or anything, just because he was petrifying to these women, he would arrange for a sex worker to come to his flat. And on one occasion, one sex worker literally escaped in the nick of time because he already wanted to practice his BDSM without any boundaries. He never had, like, safe words, any boundaries that are established on when to stop, when it's too much. He never had any of that. So in the early 2000s, the sex worker came to his flat, but she immediately saw certain red flags in what he wanted her to do, and also she felt trapped because he kind of cornered her and has locked the door and had his back to the door, which was her only exit. So she was thinking quickly, and smartly she said, listen, I forgot the condom. I just need to go to my back outside of the room, like get a condom, I'll be right back. And he let the guard down. As soon as she got out of that room, she ran out to the flat and was banging on everybody's doors. And finally, somebody did call the police and, like, said there was there's a person in distress here. But, unfortunately, the police came on that occasion and they questioned both of them. And she explained the situation. She told them the exact truth. But because she was a sex worker, she was treated poorly. They didn't trust her at first. And Stephen had a justification. He said, okay, she's a sex worker. We obviously going to have sex voluntarily. But actually, I noticed there is some money missing out of my wallet. So I actually think she robbed me. So instead of arresting him, the creep of the town, they arrest her. But after further interrogation, they did let her out because her story was matching. Like, there was a condom in the bag. People whose doors she was banging on trying to get help supported her statements. And also, they had all of these complaints from these strip clubs 
about Steven. So this is the time when his own police force starts internal investigation into him. While they are conducting this internal investigation, they suspend him for 20 days. And for 20 days he seemed to calm down, however, that was just on the surface, because he has already found his next victim in this hairdresser. So for about 20 days he was lurking around her salon, just like going in, chatting with her every day. And then as soon as his suspension was lifted, he appeared there in his police uniform. So this woman was really intimidated. So instead of, you know, coming down, trying to keep it quiet, even during his suspension, he just doubled down. So the police eventually had enough evidence to just stop with the suspensions altogether and fire him from the police force. And this is when everything started spiraling down, because in 2002 his dad, the sergeant, his motivation if you wish, also died, and his dad left him with a quarter of a million dollars inheritance. And now you think like he could turn it around, he could just do something else. But Steven didn't know how to do anything else, so he started like investing in these little businesses that led nowhere, and soon enough he found himself in debt. Now he's in debt, he barely found a security officer post, and after 2010 he really turned to the internet. He wanted to explore this BDSM scene. And once he would log in to these BDSM websites, in my opinion, he knew exactly what victim profile he is looking after. Jenny Gomez, his first victim, was in very vulnerable position at the time that he started chatting with her, and he exploited that fully. She was actually brought up in foster care, she had a tough childhood, had gone through a teenage pregnancy, and then has lost custody to that child completely. And on top of that, she also had just sporadic contact with her father at the time. So even her social media profiles outline that she is somebody who had no one who she is in regular contact with. Here we don't have the information that the police managed to gather from Laura's laptop, but I suspect it was the same kind of manipulation, because of a few things. Again, like in the second case, Jenny deleted all of her social media profiles just before she was to travel and meet Steven, and she also even flew between Oregon and Wisconsin and he picked her up from the airport. And the last thing that she has done was to tell her friends that she was moving in with a family member, but she didn't give them any further details on where to contact her or how to. Here Steven picked Jenny up from the airport and he has driven her to a hotel where they have engaged in breath play, and she ended up dead. Jenny was only 19 years old. Here's the kicker, because we don't have the CCTV footage in this first case. But what we have is his confession later, and just in general what the police has found on the scene of the crime. I had to say this special, special moment for the people, with special place in hell reserved, for now. Because when he killed Jenny, he applied the exact same exit mode, where he put her body in her own suitcase and dispatched her out of the hotel into his car. When it comes to Jenny, he brought the suitcase with her body in it to his house, after which he proceeded to open up his fridge empty everything out of it, out of its drawers, out of every single shelf, take everything out, and then put this suitcase inside the fridge. Let's just sit with that one for a second, because this guy lived with this suitcase inside the fridge for months. One of the cops that is interviewed on the crime watch actually compared this to the case of Jeffrey Dahmer, because again, this is like a similar area of Milwaukee and Wisconsin, where Jeffrey Dahmer used to lurk, and he just found that like it's such a bizarre detail. As well as we do. When it comes to when it comes to Jenny, he was so nonchalant in trial, but he tried to play it and try to gain sympathy from the judge and the jury 
which just looked awful. Like, it's better if he didn't say anything. Very sorry that this occurred. And I'm very sorry uh, Jenny was the uh, victim and I wasn't able to protect her uh, the way I was supposed to. Steven is back on his websites and he starts luring another victim. And this time it was Laura Simonson, who was 37 at the time. And she has actually just went through a couple of traumatic events. So she also went through her divorce and lost custody of her children as well. But what's even more saddening is that that same year, in 2013, she lost her 13-year-old daughter. So she was dealing with grief and while doing that she also found fascination with BDSM and was just chatting with people online and exploring this. Steven managed to exploit her grief and feed all of these desires that she might have been thinking of due to obviously her divorce, losing custody of the children and now like her daughter's death about just disappearing off the face of the earth. So he would be giving her advice like you need to stop paying any of your parking tickets, you need never to renew your driver's license again, delete all of your social media, like stop being anywhere on the internet like under your full name. And she of course unfortunately did all of this. So a similar thing happened with Laura, except that, as I mentioned, her mom was the one to file missing persons report and people were actually looking for her. Because she had other children as well at home, but nobody had any idea where she is. When it comes to Laura, the similar thing happened where she traveled to his area, she tracked in in her name, probably again advised by him just based on everything else, and then she exited that hotel in that suitcase on that trolley. With Laura, however, because he didn't have anywhere cold to keep her in the house, he kept her in his trunk. I still to this day cannot believe that this guy was ever a police officer just because he does the dumbest shit ever. Of course, as soon as the weather started warming up, it went from winter to summer days, and he didn't change the location of this body in the trunk, it obviously started to smell. So, because he would use his car to travel to work, a lot of people at the parking lot at his workplace, where he was the security officer, started complaining about the smell. And the way that they are portrayed in this Crime Watch documentary, it sounds as if they would nonchalantly come and say, oh, it smells like a dead body in there. So his supervisor told him to just get rid of the smell. Just like some people have special kind of luck because how was he never stopped like in a traffic stop and then somebody asked him to like open up the trunk. Like imagine that discovery. It would traumatize everybody but imagine that discovery. Also if somebody reports it smells like a dead body it is probably a dead body. Call 911 or 999 if you're in the UK. So, because of this, Steven went home with that car, put the other suitcase with Jenny's body inside, and then has driven 50 miles to the outskirts of Milwaukee, where he has dropped these suitcases. When this went to trial, he received 35 years for the first murder, 25 for the murder of Laura Simonson, and then received 10 years for hiding, concealing the location of the bodies. And these sentences are to be served concurrently, which means he is not even going to be eligible for parole until he is 98 years of age. And this district attorney in this documentary really tried to nail that, like, that that's exactly what they were trying to do, not to let him out of the prison when he's still in any capacity to hurt a single person. Because Steven Zelich is exactly the type of person that as soon as you were to let out, he would be looking for another chance to reoffend. But that's the case of Steven Zelich. What did you think about the guy? What do you think motivated him to just switch to crime? Was he born like that? Did he get motivated like somewhere along the way? And aren't you, aren't you afraid, is what I want to ask, because 
I think about this every now and then, you know, like middle of the night, I'm like, hmm, I really don't feel comfortable with the fact that, you know, you can't read minds of certain people sometimes and know what their motivation for certain jobs within power, within authorities, really is, because that would really be great for certain positions. Like, why are you really trying to be a cop? Is it because you can't get a girlfriend and then now you're going to use your position of authority to harass women around town because that's how it looks after a couple of years, you know, your true colors really come to the surface. But one thing before I leave you, because this is what pisses me off every single time I listen to like a coverage of any case that involves anything to do with BDSM, literally anything. When it comes to BDSM, it's truly vilified in any single true crime case. And that's a problem, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. And I think I understand why it's a problem, because obviously that's what makes the news in the media. It's like, oh my god, it's dramatic, this is how it happened. There was bondage involved, wow, this is going to sell my newspapers or whatever, it's going to be a clickbait on the internet. You're gonna get paid per view, journalism, love it. But what people lose perspective of when they read those articles is that still the blame is with the criminal, with the killer, with somebody who perverse that whole world of BDSM, who used that platform the way he shouldn't have, who then manipulated these women to meet him never set any boundaries, never explain to them how it should work, there should be clear boundaries of what is allowed, what should be forbidden, are there safe words, is there anything that is out of bounds. He just did what he put in his profile, he just wanted a slave, somebody completely submissive to him and he just perverted the whole game. And that's who we should be vilifying in these cases. The actual criminal rather than the practice. You understand me? Understand me? Do not fuck with BDSM. Mm -mm. Well, I hope this is my first and last time in this bed because it's hell uncomfortable. And also it's just beige and grey. But until I'm back in my comfort zone, you're getting a Last Meals video this Friday. And then I will see you for a gone bed next week. And until then, you keep your dream jobs legal, okay? Just keep it legal. You can dream of your American dream. Legalities. I legalize it. Keep it legal on the legal side, on the safe side. Bye now. Bye now. It's Rabiosa, not Leviosa. Get it? Why are they the funniest thing on the internet? Listen, you get me. You get me. They're the funniest. And she looks like a fan in that picture. But still, my favorite, my best one to date is the Bill Gates one. Because <laughs> I'm just like somebody sitting out there believing that Shakira taught Bill Gates everything he knows. <laughs> this little guy, like, you're fine. I do. Sure. I feel out of place. So, uh, it's too beige. It's too beige. I'm like Penelope Garcia in Criminal Minds. I don't like it. Too beige. It's not my safe place there. I had like all my little things in the backdrop to keep me safe from these criminals. Here, it's this bed frame. I look like I'm in a frame. I don't like it. It's beige. But of course, he does not see this as anything disturbing or he just disassociates from the fact that he isn't using his fridge now because it's occupied with a human body. He's living with a human body in his flat. These are the creepiest kind of people. What's going on for your head? Now that the police is tailing Steven's ass. <laughs> aggressive. Aggressive. If a lawnmower is mowing alone on a lawnmower, doesn't that make him the lawnmower? I had to get felt with this. You're literally mentally fine. What?